Good morning. I had old Deacon one time. I asked him what time it was. He held up his watch. He said, every morning they call and they set Big Ben by that right there. So, I'm ready. It's 11 o'clock, so we're ready to go. Are you proud to be in God's house? Yes. Right, say it again. Are you proud to be in God's house? Yes. There you go. Let's all stand. When we all get to heaven, it's going to be good stuff. Wait. Hang on. Wait, hang on. Our, our God didn't. Where's our words? 514 in the books. Who ready? When we all get to heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing a just last verse. Here we go. Onward to the prize before us. Soon his beauty will be whole. Soon. Sing like you go going. Here we go. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing. Do that chorus again. Come on now. Cause when we all be starting something a little bit new on Monday nights we have a men's uh, uh, we have a men's Bible study that comes together and what we're trying to do is introduce some of our men to uh, different aspects of the ministry in the church and brother Thurman today he's going to come up here and he's going to read a scripture and he's going to do the announcements and things so uh, I just I just want to introduce you to him uh, he's one of the men that's been coming every single Monday night he also teaches a, uh, a Bible class on uh, Sunday night, uh, with, uh, does real good, Connie says, and experiencing God, and uh, praise the Lord for that. So let's welcome Brother Thurman up here as he comes, and he's going to introduce a little bit about himself, too. Come on, Brother Thurman. Morning. Morning. Uh, I'll be honest, my face gets really red. Uh, my wife's a nurse, so if I go down, she's trained in what to do. <laughs> Please don't. Uh, the announcements, we've got the Valentine's dinner coming up Sunday, February the 12th. That's in your um, booklet brochure. There's a calendar with different events. Um, we've got the, tonight, we've got the... Johnson Grass, uh, Christian Music Singing, that'll be at 6. Y'all come on up and we'll celebrate with that. It's uh, uh, finger food. Amen. Bring what you... Amen. <laughs> Bring something you'd like to eat. Uh, also, on our men's Bible study, I'd like to give a little plug for that. As Brother Blaine said, we've been coming on Monday night. It's a small group, but it's... Um, we're really seeing God move. And the thing is, is 
you know, Satan isolate. We feel isolated. We come and we read and study with men, and it makes us, you know, we all go through different stuff. It's it, our little saying is iron sharpens iron. We're strengthened by other people's, through Christ, successes and failures. And I mean, if you, if you want to learn more about the Lord, plus we eat on Monday night too. So, so come up here. Um, I'd like to share a Bible verse with you. Uh, it's uh, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Um, if anyone confesses me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if anyone denies me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. So as we read the Bible, we pray for wisdom. To me, that says, confess. In, in my weakness, Christ shines. I'm strong because of Christ. I'll give you a little condensed version. I suffered with addiction 20 plus years. In, anything you can think of. The last five years was, a, was IV. Um, and the reason I tell you this is because to lay it out, this is... I'm, I'm broken, but, but by God, Amen. confessing my weaknesses, um, it gives me power. So as we struggle with stuff, as we um, give it to God, my God still sits on the throne. He's saving, he's saving souls. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you giving thanks. We give thanks to, to meet together, Father, with the privilege to to learn and study and praise, Father, to be in the house with believers, everybody who's drawn here to just serve you, Father, draw closer. I ask that you just give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Father, of, of where we can share our testimony. There's no testimony too small, none too big, Father. As your word says, there's nothing new under the sun. Our testimony is would give hope and encouragement to somebody struggling, Father. I ask that you give us the the wisdom to, to use it, Father. I pray that you be with us as we go into the service. I pray for Brother Tyler and everybody playing the musical instruments, Father, that it just, it bring glory to you. I pray that you open our hearts, Father, to hear the word. I pray that you be with Brother Blaine as he opens his mouth, Father. I pray that you give him utterance to yes. proclaim the gospel boldly, Father, that to Jesus be all the glory. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I wasn't coming there. Thank you for that. Thank fixing that. This is just where you would have a choice of being sick. The others will be sick. And the kids and the youth will be serving. Everybody will be a sit down meal for all the couples and all that. Can you list two people on one sheet? You can. Just write it somewhere on there and put it on the sheet. Thank if you, you want to list it on one sheet, that's fine. Just as long as it's just laid with the back. Well, no, I'm going to discuss that in just a second. Thank you. I've been making, since the last year that I've been here, I have been making a focus on chicken and dumplings. And if you ever wonder if your words are really making an impact, last Wednesday night, Lauren Thurman brought chicken and dufflings. She did that for me, not for y'all. Y'all got to eat it. She done that for me, okay? Remember that, okay? Thank you, Lauren. And we were, and we were thankful. <laughs> oh, he got to go. Okay, we, we just talked about when we all get to heaven. That's the end time, okay? When we all get to heaven, it's going to be great. But guess what? We still got to live here. But always remember, as long as we live here, this world is not our home. Let's stand. This world is not our home. We're just a passing through. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's own.
And that's one thing I know My Savior pardoned me And now I onward go I know He'll take me through Though I am weak and poor And I can't feel at home In this world anymore Listen that good band while we sing Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you If heaven not my home Then what will I do? The angel beckoned me From heaven's open door And I can't feel at home In this world any Number four, last verse Just up in glory land We'll live eternally The saints on every hand Are shining back from heaven's door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore oh Lord you know I have no friend like you if heaven not my home then Lord what will I do the angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore of course again oh Lord Oh, Lord, you know I have no Then, Lord, what will I do? The angel beckoned me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Well, now, if we can't feel at home, but we can't leave, then what do we do? We got to work. We'll work when? Till Jesus comes. And then be gathered home. First and last verse. <clears throat> oh, land of rest for thee, I sigh when will the moment come when You know, we look at this world, we talk about it ain't our home, but we in the end days, folks. I promise you, we in the end, if it's tomorrow or a thousand years, we're still in the end. And God is going to take care of us. These are the days of Elijah. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness be restored. And though these are days of great trials, a famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare ye the way. And these are the days of your servant, David, rebuilding a 
Let's think about this. We didn't talk about going to heaven. We didn't talk about this world ain't our home. We didn't talk about what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. But until then, it is well with my soul. dumplings and food has got me all messed up in the Lord and help us.
while the choir is going down and Cody's coming up here next Sunday, 5 o'clock, we will start choir practice for the Easter program. So prepare yourselves. Some of you have gotten a notice already. Some of you will get a notice that you have a solo coming up. So prepare yourselves for that. If you'll open your Bibles up, Matthew chapter 5, look at verse 6. Do you want to be different? See, that's going to be the question. 
Do you really want to be different? You know, everybody gets excited about seeing numbers. It's not about numbers. It's about being who Christ wants us to be. Being different. And see, a lot of times we don't want to be different, do we? Because you'll be ridiculed if you're different. Um, you'll be criticized if you're different. My goodness. It'd be a fulfillment of Scripture. But we all want to be like everybody else, and we want to fit in. We want to be the way they want us to be. We want to wear the clothes that they want us to have. And Christ calls out to us to be different. And as we look at Scripture today, you know, each one of us are really uniquely created. Every one of you got, you know, different color hair, get different color skin. Each one of us is, you know, some are smarter than others. Some have different gifts, different. And some people sing. Some of us can't. Every one of us is different, but we're all created, created by Jesus Christ. There's one thing we all have in common, though, and that's we hunger and we thirst. You know, the other day when I was... Uh, I, we happened to go to a restaurant. I, I finally got Tedris to, uh, to, to leave with me, and we went over there to the Cyprus uh, landing. And when we went up in there, you know, and it was a, it was a wait. And I don't know if it had enough employees, what it was, but it was a wait, quite a long wait. It didn't matter. Me and Tedra was just getting out. But when we got in there finally, and after waiting a while, and they sat me right behind uh, a particular couple. And, uh, you know, everything can and will be used in the pulpit. <laughs> and as when I went in there, the, what's the odds of them sitting this right next to Ellis and Tammy? <laughs> you know, and I, I didn't even recognize Ellis at first, to be honest with you. I really wasn't looking for people. But when I went in there, I, I seen something about Ellis. That I could tell, you know, he had been sick. He had a stomach virus there a while back. I don't ever check on him because he preaches all over the place and they, they go all over and stuff. But I could see that he had been sick. And the whole family had went through with the plague, that stomach virus going through. But with Ellis, it, it really showed up in his, his face a lot. And he was an extremely, he was pale. But sitting in front of him was this massive steak. Because <laughs> he, he started feeling better. And his body needed the nourishment. It needed the protein. I'm looking there like, oh man, you've had that stomach virus. You're going to eat that steak? He ate that steak. You know why? Because he knew he had to have something in him to get his strength back. As we look at this scripture today, if you were physically able, would you stand with me today as we read this? I want you to just look at this scripture, and I don't want you to overcomplicate it, but I want you to just look at that right there. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So, you know, blessed means to be happy. So happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be here today. We thank you, God. Lord, even as Lord Connie's going out there to a, a service for a young man who couldn't see ever escaping what he was going through in life, I pray, Father, that, Lord, through the difference that we make, that people can see that there's hope. I pray that you will use Connie today, Lord, to bless those in, in that service, that people will reach out with the love of Christ as people go through things that they never imagined that they would go through. May we show a difference in all our actions and deeds, in the way we talk, in the way we raise our children, in the way we go about life, that we place you first in all things. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, it's really a strange statement when you look at that, because when I start thinking about being hungry and thirsty, I sure don't think about being happy. But when I look at the scripture I hear, Jesus is explaining something to us, the kind that makes us different, the kind of hunger, the kind of thirst that will make you different as a child of God. So what he's really asking us is how much do you want righteousness? How much do you want to be right with God? You know, as you was watching uh, my brother Savoy there and Brother Thurman there, uh, so uh, they, they both show up on our, our Monday night Bible studies, and each one craves to be different. You know, when I was watching uh, Brother Savoy there the other day, he was come up here and he practiced, and I was watching him as he had his, 
His son was on his, this right-hand side, and his daughter was right here on the left-hand side. I was trying to get pictures. None of my pictures come out, Nikki. I'm sorry, because I was going to put them up there. But I was watching as the children were looking at Daddy. And I was watching as they, they were facing him and looking. And I could tell they wanted to be like Pops. Everybody wants that. And I'm going to tell you something. As, as people of God, as men of God, I, I pray that we set the best example for our children to learn to, to worship, to praise, to, to sing, to, to get up and, and read the scriptures, to, to pray, to, to people will see Jesus in us. How much do we want righteousness in our life so that other people will recognize Christ in us? Do I, do I want as much of Christ as what I want, like some of these, uh, these crawfish? I find it hilarious here in Mississippi. You know, everybody loves crawfish. And y'all are willing to pay, like, outrageous money for a crawfish. I grew up catching them things in the ditch. <laughs> and we, we grew up and we ate them and everything. But y'all willing to pay, like, $5 a pound? Man, I, I struggle with a shrimp with that. But you know why y'all want that? It's because it's something you, you enjoy that taste. You, you enjoy how much it fills you up. You, you enjoy the, when we eat crawfish, we all get together and we all fellowship and stuff. Do I want Christ more than I want these foods? Do I want Christ more than I want something to drink? Uh, do I want him as someone who's so thirsty that I crave the Lord Jesus Christ? See, he, he, he's teaching us something. He asserts that if you truly hunger, if you're truly thirsty for him after that righteousness, that you're going to be blessed or you're happy. You know, people... There's been some, some different things that have happened in our community and, and really heartbreaking to me. Uh, young people, very young ages, and everybody says, well, it can't happen in my family, it can't happen. But I'm telling you, people around us are broken. People around us are hurting. And percentage-wise, probably there's somebody even here today that's hurting and going through something in their lives. And what I, I, I would hope each one of us would do is be able to introduce them to who was able to transform our lives. Who is able to change us? So when I look at this hungering and, and thirsting, it, it suggests something to us. And, you know, to me, it starts, I start thinking being hungry, I start thinking about thirsty, I start thinking about being agony and pain. I start thinking about my stomach growling, especially if you're, you're trying to go on a diet and everything, you know, and those things that you really crave are, are sitting right there in front of you at these, all these uh, pre church eating meetings and stuff. But Jesus, what he does is he takes this picture and he, he makes it a bright outlook. He changes it we, and he suggests something for us on how it gives us life and how it, how it gives us, we, we're able to grow with it and how it brings a joy into our life. You know, a baby, as soon as the baby's born, it's amazing to me, they, they, they suck in that air and the first thing they want to do is they want to eat. They're, they're hungry, they're, they're thirsty. So why is this taking place? Because they're alive. Even though the world says it's just a clump of cells, let me tell you something. These are children right here. They're alive. And when you're a born-again Christian, there should be a hungering that comes into your heart and to your life. You should be hungering and thirsting for Jesus Christ and more of him. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, this is what it says. 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 2, it says, Like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. Respect of knowing who you serve. Lots of people claim to be born-again believers, but they don't even know nothing about the Christ they serve. You know, in Texas, they struggle with a particular plant. We use it to smoke wood. It's mesquite. But a mesquite plant drinks 55 gallons of water a day. Did you know that? I didn't know that. So what they want to do, though, is they want to get rid of it so that they can produce more grass for the cattle herds. So they'll go in there and they cut it out. And as soon as they cut those roots on these mesquite trees, they die for thirst. When it comes to our lives right here, when we quit drinking uh, of the Word of God, when we quit uh, growing closer to Christ, when we quit desiring to praise His name, when we quit wanting to have that quiet time with Christ, there's something wrong. Uh, when you love, when, when the one that you supposedly love that you don't hunger for, it, when you're not thirsty for the righteousness, perhaps there's a problem in your life. Maybe 
Maybe it is you just don't have no life. Maybe you've grown so dry and brittle, and what you need is a revival happening in your heart. Because it takes place, because what happens, the world is selling you something all the time. The world is selling you boxes and boxes of M&Ms and chocolates. But you will starve to death eating on those kind of foods. What you need is the protein. Just like Brother Ellis wanted to get that big old steak. He wanted to have that protein in his body to give him strength. He looked uh, gaunt. You know, you could see. And Brother Ellis said in those few days that he hadn't eaten in a while. He needed the nourishment. He needed the protein. You need the nourishment. You need the word of Christ in your life. You see, when we're hungry for it, for, that, for more of God, when we hunger for him, you know that you have your life in Christ. And it reflects this life's always what brings us happiness. The reason so many people are struggling, the reason so many marriages are on the rocks, the reason so many people are walking around saying, I'm just not satisfied. You have husbands coming in here. You have wives coming in saying, I just... There's something missing in my life. It's always there, and it's always the same, and they don't recognize it's because they're not letting go of themselves and pursuing after a closer relationship with Jesus. They have become satisfied with the commercials selling M&Ms. Christians that insist on, like, going to the church all the time, you know the ones, you know them, them churchy people. You know the ones that always want to be in a Bible study and stuff? The, the ones that's always trying to get over there and when you have problems, they're, they're opening the word up and they're praying all the time. You know, the ones that's always offering the help of, a helping hand with no aspect of anything in return for it. Those kind of Christians have a healthy relationship with Christ. Christians that love to be with the fellow believers and the worship. I, you know, I was talking to somebody earlier today. You know, it's so easy just to stay at home and, and be with your group because everybody in the group will agree with you. But when you start getting to churches, you have different ones that may not agree with you or maybe they're a little bit loud or, or maybe they're just a little bit different or something like that from who you are. Maybe, maybe they don't have the same, same skin tone or something like this and people struggle with it. But when the love of Christ is overflowing into a church body, when the love of Christ is overflowing in the body of Christ, it transforms us. It changes on how we look and how we think about other people. When you can't get enough of God, now think about it. Do you ever talk to your spouse and say, listen, uh, we've been at church. We've already been at church a couple times this week. Ain't that enough? I want you to think about it. Why is it one desires more? Let me ask you this, because I, I, I told several of the, the families here, I said, you know, the ultimate goal to me is to get your children to cry every time they pass by the church and say, I want to go to church. Have it, has it happened? See, that's what my goal is. My goal is that, that they feel so loved, so cared for, so so welcome that they all, and they don't realize that you don't have church all, every single day. Well, you'd really do at your house. There is a church service that's always going on. But the problem is so many times in our lives, we say, I just don't want no more of that. We, we get a good report from Christ when we hunger and thirst after him. That's the great physician, and, and he sees us. That's when you know that you're, you're a spiritually healthy person when you want more of the Lord and less of the world. To hunger and thirst for righteousness, what it does, it, it means that you're going to eat well spiritually. And, and, and when you feast on that nourishment from God, he grows you. It, you can see it in, in, in different Sunday school classes around here. You can see it on the men's Monday night Bible study. You can see it in the Bible study we do on Sunday night about experiencing God. And many of you have had revelations of what God is doing in your life. And, and all of a sudden you're saying like, wow, I never thought of it this way before. And so you, you want to get deeper and deeper and deeper, deeper, going into the, the meaty portions of the scripture. It's transformation. The church at Corinth, they had experienced this delayed spiritual growth though. 
And it says in um, it says in First Corinthians chapter three, verses one and two. It says, "And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now." You're not yet able. And you, you look at this right here. They, they were satisfied with just going through the shallow end of it. They were, a lot of, they were a lot of shout and jump. But they weren't growing in their relationship with Christ. And you look up the original word in this, and it's called sarkanos. Sarkanos. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right. But I looked it up. It means uh, fleshly. Of the flesh right here. And the whole idea is in the description of it is the idea of someone who is weak. Someone who's lost all of it. They, they couldn't get the truth out of the word of God. See, the Holy Spirit reveals this to us. And the closer we walk with Christ, the more these revelations take place. It's more than just being a good person. It's more than just somebody who's a good daddy or a good mama. It's someone who wants to draw close to Christ and is growing in their relationship with Christ and in the word. It said in the commentary that these guys were characterized by strife. Now, isn't that something you've seen in the churches before? Have you seen churches with strife? Have you seen homes with strife? Have you seen where there's relationships that are always on the rocks? It's because they're not seeking after a closer walk with Jesus Christ. Until we start desiring that Christian worship, until, until we take time in our Christian prayer, in Christian fellowship, uh, until we come to this point where that is our desire of our hearts, there's something wrong. And what we have to do is identify it. If you come down and your kid's sick and they're running a fever and their throat swole up and their nose is running and their face is red, don't you take them to a doctor? Here's what we need is a close walk with the doctor, Jesus Christ. It's nothing but the blood can transform your homes and your relationships. That's what can heal the broken, the broken homes around our society today. That's what can... That's what can deliver the broken world. You know, there's, there's wars and there's rumors of wars. We've been hearing it for a long time now. But you know, they, they just increase. I'm not trying to scare you. I just want you to think. You know, right now, y'all know what the nuclear clock is? Do any of y'all know what the nuclear clock is? So this was all the way back there. When they, when they first developed the nuclear bomb, they, they had a clock and they put it up there. And the closest it had ever been was with the Cuban Missile Crisis. As it, that it ever be to nuclear war. Do you know for the first time in history, because this goes back a long time, this goes back there all the way to the 1950s, all the way through the early 60s and stuff, we're at the closest time in all of history right now on the nuclear clock. Now most people, I know in today's society, they don't really read news or nothing like that, and they, they watch a lot of this uh, tic-tac or talk, or whatever that's called. And that's where they get their news media from. But what that means is, because of what the, the symptoms that they're seeing, that we're the closest that we've ever been to a nuclear disaster right here. So, uh, uh, what's going to give you peace during this time? See, most of us grew up during a period where, uh, you know, they would get us to have, you know, instead of tornado drills, we would have nuclear bomb drills. Oh, did I say that? Most of us grew up, well, older people. The older people, not the younger people. We grew up in a different world than what we do, we have today. Now, this world is fragile, and it's cracking all around us. It's it, the, the, the economy, uh, they're, they're set to kick off the new digital money in July, by the way. It's on the calendar. July, the new digital money will start coming out. Um, and, and some of the stores are already getting set up where they will not be taking cash anymore. It's coming up. So what are you going to do? What, what do you see taking place? If you're reading your scriptures, you know that the, the symptoms. I can't tell you when Jesus is going to come. Uh, I would hope it'd be, I'm ready, let's go. But the question is, is all my family ready? The question is, is, is all the people I know, are they ready? I'm happy in my place in my walk with Jesus Christ.
But I'm going to tell you, I want everybody to have the same kind of happiness and the same kind of hungering. Not because I'm trying to fill up empty pews, but because I'm serving the kingdom of God just the same way you do. And I know the only hope that anybody has with what's taking place in the world is that they understand that a closer walk with Jesus Christ is the only hope that we have. When we hunger and we thirst, what happens is you can learn several different things according to the scripture that you couldn't learn otherwise. You see, if, if, if you were lost in the desert to have this guy, what's that called? He's, he's, is it Bear, Bear Brian, or what's his name? Bear something or other. He's on TV. In it, huh? Bear, Bear Grillis, right? Bear Grillis. So this guy, he takes these uh, Hollywood people. I don't even know who they are most of the time. But he takes them out, and they parachute into some desert or some, out in some wild place and stuff, and he teaches them to survive off the land. I tell him, take them to the home of Chitta Forest. It'd be hilarious to me. Watch them out there. But if they were taken to a desert, one of those programs I've seen, they took them and they, they, they didn't have nothing to drink. And they had this great big old, it's called a barrel cactus. And he took them and he showed them how to cut this thing open and they were able to get water extracted from it. Then he taught them that they could eat certain fruits that were growing out there. In other words, they were learning something right here. Hungering and thirsting from righteousness teach us what we really should be hungering for because the world's going to be running you advertisements all the time saying this is what you want 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 and if you notice it's destroying society they're teaching and they're they're, they're flooding all of our homes and, and every kid, when we was at that restaurant the other day, that little kid, he was, he was sitting right there next to us, and he wasn't very old, I don't know, 11 years, 10, 11 years old and stuff, and he was, he was you know, getting up out of his chair, and pop, there goes that iPhone right there on the phone, right there on the floor. It's not that it was evil in itself, but do we not understand that they're getting more information from their phones? They're getting more information than what they're getting anywhere else. Do you think they read their scriptures as much? Do you even read your scriptures as much as what you look at your iPhone? I read my scriptures off my phone. Yeah, you could. You probably would. But kind of like when I didn't go to church and say, I can get just as much church and be closer to the Lord in this deer stand than I can up there in that church with all them bunch of hypocrites. I could have probably, but I didn't. You know why? Because I was looking for something else. I was looking uh, for, for something else to, to satisfy me. You see, things can't fully satisfy you. It says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, but he answered, he says, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Have we been listening to God have you ever, you remember that story about King Midas, you know, and King Midas was this guy, he, it's, this goes back in Greek mythology, and he, he wanted everything he touched to be gold. In other words, he pursued riches. And so when he'd walk in, his clothes turned to gold, uh, the chair he sat in turned to gold, his dinner table, everything turned to gold. One day when he was coming in, because he was so, I mean, think, it's all beautiful, it's all shiny. He's got so much wealth. And lo and behold, as he walks in the door, his little girl runs and jumps to daddy because she looked up to her daddy. She loved her daddy. And as soon as she touched him, she froze in a golden state. Beautiful. Her weight in gold. I mean, she was worth a lot. No. You know what Midas discovered? He discovered that what he truly loved was someone personal. Someone <laughs> was his little girl. And he had lost her because of his pursuit of other things. If we're not careful, we're like that. We, we get everything else but our relationship with Christ right. Jesus said, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. You know, uh, you hear on TV, uh, and, and it's a big job. I've had it, heard it said here even, you know, the man who dies with the most toys wins. No, the man who lives 
because he gave his life to Jesus Christ, we'll have the happy, the abundant, the life that will transform your children's children's children. If they serve the master, you've done something great. God is the only one who can meet all the total needs that we possess. It says in Psalm chapter 42, verses 1 and 2, look what this is. As a deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Look at that scripture. God placed a, a hungering and thirsting that comes in all of us. Every person has a spiritual desire in their life. It doesn't matter what kind of atheist they are or anything else. They have a spiritual desire in them to be closer to the creator right there. And a lot of times they get off on the wrong path. They start pursuing things that are destructive. They start pursuing things that are really worthless. They pursue dead gods, the living Christ. Now, here's how I can say this, not because I'm a pastor. I'm transformed. Brother Thurman has been transformed. So if you take someone like what Brother Thurman's been through, and you go, and I, I've been to all these different um, these different meetings and stuff where uh, they give the percentages, and I, I would have people and take them to different detoxes. Do you know what the possibilities of someone who's on uh, intravenous IV usage of their deliverance is when you go to the hospitals and ask them? Zero percent. Now, y'all have personally heard a couple people come through here now over the last several years, not because of no fat preacher but because of Jesus Christ who transforms them. See, Jesus, when the more they open up their lives, the more they, it says confess your faults, and, and he come up here and he spoke. Now, think, I want you to think about that. He didn't have to tell y'all none of that stuff. Neither did anybody else who's came up here and shared their testimonies. Why did they do it? It's a fulfillment of the word. In other words, they're applying what the word of God is, and they're putting their pride down. Here's the issue. Our pride is the biggest falling point in our lives. Pride comes before the fall. And yet we look in there and we, 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 have, we look in the mirrors and we're so prideful of what we want someone else to see, someone else to think. What does Jesus think? You see, Christ says that there's nothing less than goodness that can transform you. The desire for a personal goodness in our lives. Paul said he's a he said he desired to do good, but he couldn't remember that. And here's something he, he, he realized that he wasn't all that he wanted to be. I realized I wasn't and am not who all I want to be. Thurman realized he wasn't and isn't who he all he wants to be. He desires a closer relationship with Christ. If, if we desire that personal goodness, the person, God's going to give you the power. And see, that's what we all need is the Holy Ghost power. And he, what he does is he enables us to do right. You can't blame it on others. God says that he'll do it. Do you think he can do it? I know he can do it. So when you personally desire for goodness, what he does is he saturates us. He, he fills us up with the happiness, and it becomes the reality. But when you don't hunger for it, when you hunger for things of the world, you're going to get what you want. Things of the world. Things that's going to disappoint. Things that's going to be hurtful. In Micah chapter 6, let's see, verse 8. He's told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Humbly with your God. Huh. See, what Christ does is when he comes into your life, you're going to become humble. If you're truly walking with Christ, there's going to be a humbleness 
that takes place in your life. I'll tell you what, it would end all the, the, the arguing, the disputes, because there would be a humbleness when we look at somebody else who disagrees with us and we would respect them because they're a creation of Christ. That the desire to do good is what God can do in our lives. When, when we desire to do good for somebody else, it's a reflection. We become, we become generous in our remarks about them. We're encouragers, we're uplifters, we're strengtheners about somebody else. Doing good to others is the happy way to live. That's what it says in the scripture. The desire to know God is something that's transforming to us because Jesus said, who alone is really good, right? You remember you go back in the scriptures and they said, you know, he's good. So, so why? He says, why are you calling me good? He says, that there's no one good except for God alone. Now, some, some desires in our life, they degrade us. Some of the desires in our lives, they can actually destroy us. They can lead you to a path that runs you off of the mountain. But the desire to know God, you know what it does? It edifies you. It, it, it's something, it, it instills the happiness in our heart. You know, we want the joy, the peace, the happiness of Christ to fill our lives, to fill our homes, to fill our families. But no one's happy. Nobody's happier than the people who draw near to Jesus Christ. No one's happier than the people who hunger and thirst for a closer relationship with Christ. You can't be satisfied for everything else. You can't be satisfied by just the hunt. Just the, the, the deer hunt, the, the turkey hunt, the whatever hunt. You can't be satisfied just with the, you know, uh, running around in the bar rooms and stuff and liquor and drugs and alcohol. It will not satisfy you. But I'm going to tell you, it's amazing how when you start opening your, up, your hearts up to Christ and you say, Lord, I want more of you and less of me. And how as you're reading the word of God and you're praying, how he speaks to us. And how as you're serving Christ, you can see just how blessed it is. Amen. There's nothing better. There's no, because of the, the satisfaction that's obtained by doing what God has said we should, we should do. Jesus said that those that hunger and thirst after righteousness are going to be filled up. Amen. Now just, just think about it. What, what does that mean right here? What, what satisfaction does this hungering and thirsting bring into our life? In Psalm 23, this is what it says. Now watch. Now this is experiencing the goodness of life. I want you to picture this. And y'all have read this a million times. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. So... Are you feeling empty today? Are you broke? Do you have hurts? Do you have disappointments? Do you have things out there? He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever. Amen. When we look at this right here, satisfaction of entering the complete goodness in life to come also. See, he says, I want you to be happy here. I want you to be happy there. So those who hunger are, are going to be fed. They're going to be, their needs are going to be met. Those who are thirsting for, for more of that righteousness, they're going to be given drink. All of it is going to be satisfied. The question is, though, the question is, what are you hungry for? What are you thirsty for? Really, what is your pursuit today? If I was examining your life, and I, I'm coming to it, and I'm talking to you, and I listen to your conversation, what will I discover is truly your heart's desire? Is it really Christ? If it's Christ, it's going to show up in your conversations and it's going to show up in your homes. Are you hungry? 
Are you thirsty for more than just coming to church? Listen, it doesn't matter if I'm a good preacher, if I'm a boring preacher, whatever I am. What matters is the Savior. See, all I can do is tell you what he did in my life. He changed my desires. And I'm going to tell you, you may not want that. You, you may be satisfied with where you're at. And I'm going to tell you what you're going to reap. You're going to reap what you're planting. What do you desire? What is your desire? And when you discover your desire, you're going to see where you put your study at. You're going to see what you put your time into. You're going to see what you put your finances in. You're going to see it because it's going to show up in every aspect of your life. If you want to be transformed, all you got to do is say, Lord, I need more of you like that preacher's talking about. I want more of you, Father. I'm hungry, God. I'm hungry for a difference in my life and in my home. Christ says he'll feed you. If you could bow your heads for just a moment, they're going to come play an altar call song. And listen, if you don't get nothing out of this sermon today, get this. You don't have to leave here the same way. Christ is able to transform you. He's able to change you. He's able to help you. And all you got to do is say, Lord, I'm thirsty. I've been dry in my life. I'm, I'm not really hungry for the word, Lord. I, I'm not like I once was. Maybe you've never been. I've had all these things come up and, and they're distracting me. Lord, I'm praying today that what it says in the word will come upon me, the anointing, Father. Fill me, Lord, with the Holy Spirit. I pray for that oil to overflow in my life, God, to touch my wife or my, my husband, to touch my family, to touch my children and those around me. Father, I pray that they'll see Jesus in me. If you've never given your life to Christ, if, if, if you're here today and, and you just, you're confused by what I'm saying, I'm going to tell you there can be a difference. In, first thing you've got to do is give your life over to Jesus. And all you've got to do is say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. I'm asking you to forgive me, Lord. I'm asking you to save me. I believe in you. He will save you. He will transform you ask. We have not because we're not asking for it. So as they're playing, this is your invitation. Won't you come?
everybody sing. Won't y'all look up? Let's sing. I'm tired of sin and straying, Lord. Now I'm coming home. I'll trust thy love, believe thy word, Lord. Father, we thank you so much today, God, Lord, just for your presence, your love, and the opportunities that you give us every day of our lives, Father. Lord, as we come, we just open ourselves up. We confess, God, that each one of us have different things that we're struggling with. But, Lord, we believe in the word. We pray, Father, for anything that hinders us from a closer walk with you, that, Lord, it would be removed. We pray, Father, that, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit, that, Lord, that you would give us peace that passes understanding, the joy unspeakable and full of glory. Father, we claim the promises of the word. We lift up our brethren, Lord, that's not with us today, God. Our Lord, Brother Eddie's traveling, Lord. He, he might be over there right now. I don't know. But, Lord, you know what he's going for. And we're just asking, Lord, that those tests that come back and they'll be clear. We're, we're praying for the funeral services that are going on right now. Very young people, Lord. I pray, God, that godly people will minister to the needs of those who are there and love on them uh, through all this. In the name of Jesus, I pray, God, give us ears that we might hear the voices of the hurting, that we might be who you called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Y'all don't forget tonight, the Johnson brothers are going to be here. Brother uh, Robert, you know, he's 93, and he's bringing his group. Y'all come up here. We're going to have finger foods. It's going to be a wonderful fellowship.